mutant monsters preying on anyone intruding on their terrain. I felt my life was at stake. When I close my eyes, I still clearly see the image of that creature that night. Satan's ape, attacking without warning, pouncing on its victims. If he got a hold of you, he could just literally tear you apart. The zombie witch, rising from the dead. I saw her actually reach at me. They looked like claws. It was straight fear. It was something that should have been dead, but it was alive. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. throughout the Midwest. Residents report sightings of strange mutant creatures, sometimes mistaken for children, but ones with hideously deformed heads. As legend has it, they roam the backwoods, nowhere to call home, nothing to lose, spreading terror across the country. Many of the legends about melon heads originate near the small town of Kirtland, Ohio, during the hard times of the 1930s. Back in the 30s, a gentleman claiming to be a medical doctor opened his home up as an orphanage. It's not like today where you had protocol and paperwork. Back then, no one kept track of anything. They don't know what's going on behind those doors there. According to the legend, behind those doors, an evil doctor, identified only as Dr. Crow, mutated orphan children into monsters. What Dr. Crow did was perform some very nasty, horrendous experiments on children. Prince, who was here? Uh, just another intake, doctor. People didn't want him. Well, we want him. We can help him. I remember hearing rumors about a mad doctor doing experiments on these children. Their bodies were little, but they had these gigantic heads. People started calling them melon heads. He was putting water into the children's head causing deformities as far as the way they looked, their eyes, their nose, their teeth, their body, also the shape of their head. The chances of them growing up and having a regular life was taken away from them. Whatever Dr. Crow did to the orphans, his reign of terror eventually came to a violent end. After years and years of abuse by the doctor, the children rose up, fought back, and did take revenge. No one really knows at this point what happened. I'm not sure if the doctor actually was killed. But we do know that the children burned down the mansion. We're not sure if they actually survived and moved on someplace else and started procedures in another state. It all seems too strange and gruesome to believe. If it weren't for the dozens of sightings of melon heads over the years, lending credence to this bizarre monster tale. So after the fire took place, there's a real good possibility that some of them moved on just to get away from the area. 
because we were getting, you know, sightings, you know, from the 1940s on in Michigan and Connecticut, especially. Trumbull, Connecticut is a leafy suburban bedroom community to the northeast of New York City. Seven decades since the Melonhead Scare of the 1930s, the evil Dr. Crow is almost certainly gone. Could the descendants of his twisted experiments still remain? Residents in this part of Connecticut believe they may be out there. When I was growing up, my older brother and his friends would talk to me about a legend that they called Melonheads. They were mutants that lived in a part of Trumbull that they called Dracula Drive. On highway maps, it's called Velvet Street. But for many locals here, it's Dracula Drive. One night, Chris Barrico and some friends, armed with nothing more than a belly full of courage, drove out to the woods to test the legend. I'm a big skeptic. I'm the type of person I don't believe it unless I see it. This is Drake the Drive, right? Yeah. yeah. I never thought, honestly, I would ever see anything. goes, look, I thought I saw something. There's, there's something else up there. And we thought, oh, okay, here it comes. He's trying to scare us. He goes, no, I'm dead serious. I thought I saw something. There's a deer. What is that? I don't know what I was thinking, but something inside of me said I had to do it. my flashlight and I saw the head I'm like oh my god this is happening to me going back to the depression of the 1930s generations have passed on a legend a frightening story of orphan children turned into hideous mutants. Every few years, giving life to the legend, someone swears they've encountered a melon head. I can close my eyes and still see that image, the silhouette, just like it was yesterday. That silhouette is their defining feature. Very large head, veins popping from the head, very pale. Sharp teeth. Growing up listening to the story about the melon heads, I was very skeptical. I thought it was an absolute joke and, you know, more folklore than, you know, reality until I had my experience. It's not folklore, it's not a story, it's a fact. 25 years ago, one foggy evening, on a backcountry road near Trumbull, Connecticut, Chris Barrico and his friends were legend tripping, exploring an area notorious for creature sightings. Because it is so secluded, heavily wooded, unpopulated area, it would be a great place for monsters to hide out. As they would soon discover. Dude, I'm getting creeped out. Let's, let's get out of here. We quickly saw a shadow go behind the woods. A dead deer and something lurking in the shadows. Let's get out of here. Was too much for Chris's friend. And my friends went into panic mode and said, that's it, and hightailed it out of there. I would have liked to stay. I'm the more adventurous type person. I want to see for myself exactly what it was, who it was. And I asked my friends who was willing to go back. And they both said, no, we ain't going back. They were too scared. So I said, well, I'm going back. And they said, oh, okay, well, we'll read about you in the paper that the Melonheads got you. 
couple nights later, Chris Barrico decided to return. His skepticism would be put to the test. The most I thought I would see is a wild animal in the woods. I really was not expecting to see anything more than a squirrel or at most a deer. So I get out of my car and I walk up and I did have the tightness in my chest and nerves because I'm alone. And I heard a branch break. I saw something maybe four feet tall. Shine a flashlight to see who is it. I couldn't believe it. The head was just creepy, eerie. I think I was more froze from just the shock and panic and all the emotions in a one of like, oh my God, this is happening to me. I knew I had to get out of there. I kept waiting to feel a hand grab my shoulder. I hightailed it out of there. Who knows what it was going to do to me? Was it going to try to sever one of my body parts, make an example out of me? You know, put me up as a warning sign. Don't bother us, stay away. I was honestly petrified. My husband, Chris, is not normally scared easily. Basically, he is a tough guy. That creature, whatever it was, really did scare him. While the first stories about melon heads arose in Ohio, later sightings cropped up in Michigan, Connecticut, and Florida. The mutants were on the move. Melon heads are always considered to be outcasts in society. Some may even got into the circus or to the freak shows because, you know, they did probably feel they were safe there. Being part of society was just something that they could not get used to. Perhaps some of those in the sideshows were not entirely human. They were melon heads. And it wasn't long before these godforsaken creatures were reverting to their monstrous nature. Along Florida's Gulf Coast, circuses frequently make their winter homes. Steve Pay grew up in the town of Naples, Florida, unaware of the melon heads next door. I loved growing up here. We were outside all the time. It was nothing to worry about. Uh, just go meet your friends and spend the rest of the day until the sun goes down. Nothing to worry about until the evening the monsters invaded Steve's childhood. This was only about three feet tall, but it had this gig gigantic head. My parents had some friends over. They were talking about a creature that attacked a couple of the uh, tower technicians. Just grabbed the guy by the torso and just drug him into the woods, and they still haven't found the body at all. At all. At all. At all. Body was never found. Nothing was found. It wasn't something that uh, a child should have heard. That evening, young Steve went to bed with the fear of mutant creatures. The reality he would encounter a few years later was worse than any nightmare. My cousin and his friend were over to play war games. Basically, tag in the middle of the night. Me and my best friend Chris were on one team and they were on the other. We started crawling through the field and we got almost to the wood line when we heard something behind us. They captured us and took us further back into the woods. And they duct taped us to the same tree left us there. What started as a childish prank would soon turn into a fight for survival. 
tied to the tree. We gotta get out of here. They were sitting ducks. What is that? What? I could see it in Chris's eyes. He was terrified. I couldn't turn around. But I could hear it coming up from behind me. It was coming closer and closer. And I knew it was coming first. Mutant melon heads hiding out in America's backwoods like an island of misfit toys. These small but monstrous humanoids allegedly prey upon people who wander into their territory. One night in 1986, near Naples, Florida, Steve Pate and a friend were playing a neighborhood war game. They turned up as captives and were left tied to a tree. A melon head was closing in. This thing was coming up from behind us. He could see around the tree, past me. I couldn't turn around, but I could hear his breathing. It was almost like it was excited that it was terrifying me. I started shaking. Fear was the only thing that helped me get free. I immediately just started trying to tear my hands apart, rubbing them against the tree to break the tape. Eventually it broke. All I could think of was, this thing is going to get me. I didn't even notice the cuts in my hands from the tape digging into my skin. I had the scars on my wrist for a long time. The scars would heal. The imprint left by his melon head encounter has lasted a lifetime. If I see something in the dark, see something move in the shadows, or just see something that resembles its shape, it brings it all back. Unfortunately, it lives with you forever. I don't doubt myself ever what I saw that night. I stayed away from Dracula Drive. I was scared to ever go back. Honestly, I believe they're still in that area. When they want to come out, they'll come out. They're not going to be a sideshow for you. They're not going to be your entertainment. On the western edge of the Appalachians lies the small town of West Point, Kentucky. Hidden within these ancient highlands, there are stories of a mutant creature like no other. There are things in the country that people have seen for centuries, but I would never have believed that something like that could exist. I know they exist now. I didn't before, but I know they do now. According to scientists, the last North American primates living in the wild died out some 30 million years ago. Of course, Every once in a while, there's a story about a monkey on the loose and thriving. There's no question that an animal as intelligent and resourceful as a primate can survive here. Imagine if those capacities mutated into something utterly mean. The devil monkey has been sighted primarily in the Appalachians. There's a lot of woodland there, a lot of caves. It would be a good place uh, for a creature to hide. Sometimes, these creatures don't stay hidden. They go looking for trouble. In the 1970s, Marva and Wayman Morgan moved to rural Kentucky to give their four young children a life in the country. They loved the serenity they felt from the woods close by. As they discover, those woods were hiding something monstrous. Back years ago, uh... My aunt and uncle owned this property. My uncle, he had chickens, and they had left uh, for a night and came back the next day, and all the chickens were dead. They didn't pay much attention to the family tale. But after they moved in, things began to happen 
strange things. My wife's uh, mom gave her a, a Sheltie, a little uh, collie dog. We was looking for the dog, and we thought somebody done stole it or it ran off or something. My son was walking up on the up on top of the levee, and there the dog laid, and the dog was tore all up. It was pretty mangled. I never seen anything like that around there. And then there were the noises. Me and my husband, would, we'd be laying in the bed two or three o'clock in the morning, and we hear these garbage cans just clanging and, and getting knocked around. The old metal cans was clanging. The lids was opening and slamming. We had no idea what was making that noise. We thought maybe it was dogs. The Morgans would soon learn the awful truth. The evening began as ordinary as any other. Shannon was a baby at the time, and uh, so she fell asleep on the couch, and others were watching TV. With the kids settled in front of the TV, Wayman grabbed the chance to unwind with a hot bath. The tranquility wouldn't last long. And I was in the bathtub, and the curtains blew, you know, it blew out. And this horrible odor came through the window. It smelled so bad like a bunch of old uh, wet hound dogs has been out hunting. Barbara, what's that smell? And I said, oh, I don't know. I said, it, you know, it's awful. Maybe something sort of dead. I mean, it was really grotesque. <laughs> it was terrible. I start going to the different windows, opening the curtains, looking out, and seeing if I smell anything. I went to our bedroom window and opened up the curtains. I was totally petrified. I mean, it was something that I never in my wildest dream thought I would ever come face to face with. Since the 1950s in the Appalachians in Kentucky, there have been numerous sightings of a creature resembling a baboon or small ape, a primate-like beast. So aggressive, it's come to be known as the devil monkey. The devil monkey is a very unique five to seven foot tall baboon-like creature with pointy ears, uh, it has very powerful hind legs, and it has three toes based on some of the tracks that have been found. Sometimes there is an odor, it's a, a musky, a dog-like smell that has been reported. With sharp claws and large fangs, this beast is ready for a fight. Running into a devil monkey in any kind of situation would be very dangerous. These creatures are very territorial and have been known to attack without any provocation. That's the monster that Marva Morgan was contending with. One night alongside her Kentucky home, just as she was closing the windows to a sudden, awful smell. I knew this creature was not human. I knew that it was something that I had never seen before, and I didn't know what it was going to do. Eyeball to eyeball with the devil monkey. It scared me so bad. And I screamed and run, and all the kids screamed and run and followed me into the bathroom. My wife sat there and cried. She was just couldn't even talk. It shocked her so bad. She couldn't tell me what she had saw. And then finally, uh, she did calm down a little bit, and uh, she said it was horrible. It was there, the window. What? What did you see? I said, I can't tell you what it was, but I was afraid that this creature was going to come through that window. I was afraid for my kids. Then they made a horrifying realization. Their youngest one was alone, out in the living room. I was so afraid that I left my baby laying on the couch. Easy prey for the mutant beast. Oh. 
Wayman feels blessed that he got to her in time. In the days and weeks after the terrifying ordeal, Wayman tried to make sense of the monster. The co-worker that I worked with told me that he saw a little monkey. I said, you did? He says, yeah. It was squatted down, cupping water in his hands and splashing it on its face. I thought, well, maybe what we saw is what's growed up. Though the creature never returned to terrorize the Morgans again, the memory still haunts Marva. I don't think I have ever in my life felt that afraid. These aren't happy little monkeys, to be honest with you. They, uh, they're very aggressive. Uh, they're not to be trusted. Uh, I, I personally would not want to <laughs> encounter one. Three hundred miles across the Appalachians to the east, in Saltville, Virginia, the same sort of maniacal monkey has also made its presence known. Generations of the Boyd family have lived in the same small Virginian town. My father worked on the railroad for 13, almost 14 years as a fireman shoveling coal. My mom was a cheerful, happy-go-lucky person. The oldest of five children, Scott Boyd enjoyed his childhood in the foothills of the Appalachians. You were outside, you were in the woods, you were all over the place. Nobody gave it a second thought. Until one evening in May of 1959, when that sense of safety would change. Well, I've got sandwiches if you want one. Come on. Thank you, sweetie. It is Mrs. Sandler's jam from down the road. It was moonlit, bright, and they were driving along when my dad noticed a movement coming down through the woods on the passenger side of the vehicle. What is that? animal jumped right straight out into the road and it jammed his face right up in the passenger side window my mother looked it right in the face looked straight into his eyes right into his face For six generations, the Boyd family has made coal country in the Appalachians their home. It's a place where the woods are alive with legends of a mysterious creature. There had been people that had claimed to have seen and, and, and heard and run upon things in the woods that they couldn't explain and, and actually frightened them pretty bad. One day, that kind of story arrived at Scott's front door. I remember walking out in the broad daylight and looking at the car that my dad had been driving and seeing the uh, damage down the side of that. My dad was the only one that would really talk about it because it, it seemed to have scared my mother so bad she didn't even want to listen to him talk about it. It had all started hours earlier during the night when Scott's parents, Jim and Polly Boyd, were driving on a dark mountain road. What is that? Out of nowhere, the crazed monkey monster leaped towards the car. It had its face pressed right up in the window with its lips curled back from its teeth and a snarl. Dad said you could hear it raking the side of the car, scratching and, and scrambling at the side of the car. And he said that it was running upright, pacing the car, reaching at the back of the car, grabbing at the back of the car. They gunned it down the road, worried the creature might be following. My dad, he had a, a hunting rifle behind the seat. So when he thought he'd got out far enough ahead of it, he put the car in neutral and was reaching behind him to get the rifle. And he said that it was coming at him so fast. Go now, it's coming! Get back in here! My mother, she's screaming and pleading for him not, please shut the door, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he just jerked his leg back in the vehicle and they sped off and left it behind. My mom and dad came straight on home. I can remember my mom being real quiet and real pale.
they were scratches all the way into the middle through the paint from the passenger side window all the way down the side of the car and going off the back end. They were in rows of three, never seen anything like it before or since. My dad seemed like he was almost embarrassed. You could see the, the, the fright on his face when he would talk about it. And that literally scared the, me to death, really. It, it, it bothered me for years after that. Speculation of where this beast may have come from and why it exists runs rampant to this day. Possibly the devil monkey could be a mutant that escaped from a government research facility, a regular animal that was experimented on, and the only way it can survive is to, is to attack anything that, that it, it believes are food. The area that the attack occurred in was highly polluted with heavy metals from uh, a chlorine processing plant that was in the area. Maybe some of the pollutants in the area, the groundwater, whatever, had caused a, a mutation. The creature's origin remains a mystery, but there's no doubt about the effect it had on Scott Boyd. And that literally scared the, me to death, really. It, it, it bothered me for years after that. I had a hard time riding in a vehicle down a country road to a wooded area without constantly scanning the side of the road, waiting for something like that to jump out of the car. Residing in the geographic center of America's lower 48 is Kansas, the prairie state that Hollywood fashioned as the backdrop for a young girl's encounter with munchkins, wizards, and a wicked witch. While the movie's wicked old hag was a technicolor fantasy, in Kansas's capital city, Topeka, generations of residents have grown up hearing about a real-life witch. She appears wandering the streets looking like nothing more than a harmless old woman. But that's when the real terror begins. To those who've encountered the old crone, she seems hell-bent on revenge. She wanted to scare. She wanted to make you feel terror the way she had possibly felt terror in life. The most notable uh, mystery that I think if you asked any uh, of the folks who live here uh, is the mystery of the blue albino woman. towns have stories about a monster. Topekans claim theirs started out human. The blue albino woman, she was an actual real person who lived in Topeka and the monster stories exist started to become while she was still alive because she had such a unique appearance. She was purely pale white, she had pink eyes, uh, long white hair. You could definitely, uh, when you saw her, she caught your eyes, caught your attention. No photographs exist of this woman. No one seems to know her name. Yet for many locals, she's their worst nightmare. I'm sound asleep and I suddenly wake up. And there she is. She's standing at my screen window looking at me. I was that far away from her. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Well, the common legend for the blue woman is that she was a resident of this town, that she was tormented by the populace, and that upon her death, she was unable to leave or to find rest. This monster is an angry one, and it may owe something to the alleged circumstances of her violent death. Come on, you witch! We're gonna put you in the ground where you belong! Abducted by sadistic hoodlums. Brutally buried alive. <laughs> in time, she'd take her revenge. I feel very sorry for her because I understand she must have suffered a great deal. 
But there are just things about her that make her very obviously something else. The glowing red eyes, the gaunt cheekbones, the long fingers. Generations of teenagers have roamed the back streets of Topeka, searching for a glimpse of the albino woman. They frequently go to a location on the north side of town. She's often seen in Rochester Cemetery, lurking amongst the trees, and there are many reports of her uh, uh, walking, following people, and, and eventually chasing them out of the cemetery. We're talking about what was a, a flesh and blood woman, that uh, this person rises out of the grave and, and, and chases people. We've even heard violent tales of people being ripped out of the top of their cars and uh, that she's eaten people. Tormented to death, she turns into a plague upon the living, settling old scores. And that night when she was coming towards us, she had hands up like she was ready to hurt somebody. This wasn't just a, I'm going to scare you off. This was, I am coming for you. I was really afraid she was going to hurt me, maybe kill me. Topeka, Kansas is rife with superstitions about a mutant monster, the Blue Albino Woman. Many people are afraid to even say the name the Blue Albino Lady because they fear that something will happen, that she'll rear her presence and make something crazy happen. When James George was barely a teenager, he learned the terrifying reality behind the Blue Albino legend. It was a uh, day in August, right before the school term started. I was shopping for school clothes. So James, how about these? My grandmother was manager of the children's department. James was on his way towards the fitting room when a few mannequins caught his eye. He thought they were spooky. Little did he know something far more frightening was lurking nearby. I looked at her and felt the breath leave my body. I didn't know why she was there. All I know was that she terrified me. The skin had a bluish tint to it. The eyes were red. Her whole demeanor was just terrifying. And my grandmother started yelling at her, you are not welcome here, you are not welcome in this store, you need to leave the store and leave it now. She was soundless, there was no sound, she never said anything, and she just, the only way I know how to describe it is glided out the door. I was absolutely terrified. Where did she come from? I don't know. I had never seen anything like this in my young life. Throughout history, many cultures demonstrate their fears of an evil, deformed witch. An old crone who wields dark powers, devours children, haunts your dreams. The old hag in Western culture is generally depicted as a demonic type entity that comes to people in the night. They awake to find uh, what, what they see as an old, uh, ugly old woman sitting on their chest, strangling them. Residents in Topeka, Kansas claim that what they were dealing with isn't folklore. I've personally never experienced it, but there are literally hundreds of people uh, over the years who have reported uh, sightings of the Blue Albina Woman. Uh, some people have no doubt uh, had a real run-on with what they would swear is a flesh and blood creature out there. The encounters continue to pile up. Recently added to the Albino Woman's hit list, Jessica Streeter, a small business owner living on the outskirts of Topeka. March 13th, 2013, Jessica's 25th birthday. Her boyfriend Jason had taken her out for a nice dinner in downtown Topeka. Instead of going home, Jessica had an idea for some frisky fun. So, 
Shall I take you home, birthday girl? Um, no. How about you take me to the cemetery and give me my birthday present? Okay, let's do it. All right, let's go. We decided to uh, go ahead and uh, go ghost hunting. She is something that she likes to do. And so we went up to uh, Rochester Cemetery. Rochester Cemetery does have a sort of creepy feel to it with all the old oak trees and weeping willows. And it's always just so unnaturally quiet. When did we get caught? We're not going to get So did you have a good birthday? <laughs> Good. Well, I got to tell you, it's going to get even hotter and better in just a second. <laughs> well, I was starting to get creeped out, and I think Josie was too. I was kind of hoping just the feeling would go away because I was having fun at the same time. felt her scratch at me, try to choke me. I was scared for my life. I didn't really know what to think. I, th I thought she was going to kill me. When I saw the blue woman, I felt a sense of utter terror. You know, she's supposed to just be a legend. I just wanted to get away as quick as I could. Jessica and Jason managed to drive off. I think she only affects people who are going there to look for her. Perhaps she doesn't want to be looked upon anymore. She wants to make sure that they don't ever come looking again. When I got back to the house, I was feeling very shaken. I was jumping at every sound that I heard because I was really afraid she was going to hurt me, maybe kill me if she found me. Hoping to protect herself, Jessica made use of a ritual to ward off witches. I actually put up some of the Japanese uh, paper seals and anointed the door with herbs and oil, things that are repugnant to the dead, kind of a mix of Irish and gypsy magic. I honestly believe that the blue woman is out there waiting, whether it's for revenge, whether it's for closure. I think people should be afraid of her, and I think they should stay away from her. When Topekans come face to face with the blue albino, the encounter is hard to forget. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. It was a creature. It was something that should have been dead, but it was alive. There are people out there that I do believe are mutated in some way to where maybe death don't take them the way it takes the rest of us. When death visits them, they don't necessarily die.